Hi everybody and welcome back to POCUS Cases. In this month's screencast, we are going to talk about the IVC. Specifically, we're going to look at the IVC in the context of volume status. Let's look at this case. This is a 65-year-old female who is found by her daughter lying in bed. The patient has had two days of an upper respiratory tract infection, and when her daughter went to check on her, she found her to be quite confused and lethargic. She had difficulty getting out of bed and required assistance just to make it to the washroom. When they get to the emergency department, they find that the patient is quite tachycardic with a heart rate of 125 beats per minute. The patient is also hypotensive with a blood pressure of 60 over 30. The patient has a fever of 39.5 degrees Celsius. One liter of IV fluid has already been administered, as has antibiotics and Tylenol. Despite this, the patient's heart rate remains the same, as does the patient's blood pressure. The patient has now been diagnosed with septic shock. The question becomes, does the patient need more fluids, or should we start pressors? Well, if you were taught like I was taught, all of these patients need two liters of fluid. I kind of found this funny that every single patient with shock required the exact same amount of fluid. Let's take a look at this paper. How much fluid resuscitation is optimal in septic shock? This author concluded that careful individualization of fluid resuscitation is required to achieve adequate mean arterial pressure in septic shock patients. Let's look at this other paper. These authors concluded in this paper, after reviewing the FEAST trial, the PROCESS trial, the ARISE trial, the PROMISE trial, all of the recent large sepsis studies, and they determined that the optimal volume and endpoints of additional fluid administrations are unclear. This is where POCUS can be of value. The IVC collapsibility can help determine if patients are going to be fluid responsive or not. Also, there are now protocols in place where you can use the inferior vena cava to determine the amount of fluid resuscitation that's needed. So let's see how this works. When using POCUS, patients who are likely to respond to fluid have an IVC that is not full of fluid. That means that when you view the IVC, the IVC obviously collapses. And the IVC diameter is quite small, less than one centimeter. Alternatively, in patients that are unlikely to respond to fluid, the IVC is already full of fluid. The IVC barely collapses, and the IVC diameter is wide, greater than two centimeters. Notice a couple of things on this slide. First, notice the terminology that I'm using, likely to respond to fluid and unlikely to respond to fluid. The reason why I'm using this terminology is that even with patients whose IVC looks like they're unlikely to respond to fluid, they may actually respond to fluid. And also patients who are likely to respond to fluid based on their IVC may not respond to fluid. So it's not an exact science in this case. However, the IVC can still be helpful in determining if a patient's likely or unlikely to respond to fluid, especially if you look at these numbers that I have on the screen. I have asterisks beside the less than one centimeter and greater than two centimeters. The reason is if you look at the literature, you're going to see a wide range of these numbers. I specifically chose these numbers because in my experience, these numbers represent more of the extremes where patients are more likely or less likely to respond to fluids. So let's look how to perform the IVC POCUS. First, we're going to start with the ultrasound probe in the epigastric area with the marker pointing towards the patient's head. Then we're going to do a slight movement to the patient's right in order to obtain the IVC on the screen. This is a view of the IVC. Let's look at the anatomy in a little bit more detail. This area here is the liver. This organ here is the heart. And you can see that there is a tubular structure that appears to be going into the heart, that is the IVC. We can now measure the IVC 
to determine if the patient's likely or unlikely to respond to fluid. Let's take a look at this example. Here's your liver, here's your heart, and here is the IVC. When I play the video, you'll notice that the IVC barely collapses. The walls barely come together, and the IVC looks full. On this still image, you can measure the IVC to determine how full it is. Here is your liver here, and here, from this area here to this area here, is the intrahepatic portion of the IVC. This portion of the IVC is extrahepatic. To get the most accurate measurement, you want to measure the intrahepatic portion of the IVC. If you were to measure the extrahepatic portion of the IVC, it's under other factors that can affect its size. For example, if someone has a lot of gas in their abdomen, that extra pressure can affect the size of the IVC. But it won't affect the size of the IVC within the intrahepatic portion. So you want to measure the intrahepatic portion of the IVC. In this case, when we measure the intrahepatic portion of the IVC, we get a measurement of greater than 2 centimeters. This is a patient who has an IVC that's barely collapsing and has an IVC greater than 2 centimeters. This patient's IVC is already full and they are unlikely to respond to more fluid. Let's take a look at this example. This is our liver, this is our heart, and this here is the IVC. When I play this video, you'll notice that the walls almost touch each other. This is an IVC that's obviously collapsing. And over here in this still image, we have the liver and we have our IVC. When you measure the intrahepatic portion of this IVC, you'll notice that the IVC is quite small, less than one centimeter. In this case, it's 0.85 centimeters. So this is a scenario where the IVC obviously collapses and the IVC measures less than one centimeter. This is an example of a patient who is likely to respond to fluid as the IVC is not full. So let's go back to our case. Our patient's still tachycardic and hypotensive despite a liter of fluid already given. When we go to measure the IVC, you'll notice that the measurement of the IVC is quite small, less than one centimeter. And when we play the video, you'll notice that the IVC is collapsing quite a bit. This is a patient who's likely to respond to fluid. In this case, I would give another liter of fluid and then re-ultrasound the patient, keeping a close eye on their hemodynamic state. Generally, I like to fill up the pipes as best I can before I start to squeeze them with some pressers. So in this case, I think more fluids is the right answer, and we'll hold off on pressers until we fill the pipes a bit more. The other wonderful thing about IVC POCUS is that the findings are quite dynamic, meaning that if I give this person another liter of fluid and I go to re-ultrasound them, the IVC should fill up and I should be able to remeasure it, and the measurement should be bigger than 0.9 centimeters. Thus, I can see if there's interval improvement in the amount of fluid this patient has in their IVC, and it can be used as a dynamic marker in resuscitation. As with all ultrasounds, there's always a few cautions that everyone should be made aware of. There are some gray zones with IVC POCUS. If you remember back to that table, I said that the IVC is most likely to respond to fluid if it's less than one centimeter, and less likely to respond to fluid if it's greater than two centimeters. That means that there's a gray zone between one to two centimeters. So there are indeterminates. In this case, you'll need to use other data points besides POCUS. So if I were to have a measurement between one to two centimeters and there was some collapsibility, but it wasn't obviously collapsing and it wasn't barely collapsing, I would use other data points such as, does this patient have crackles in their lungs? Does this patient have fluid in their extremities and pin edema? Let's take a look at this example of an indeterminate. When you measure the distance of this person's intrahepatic IVC, the number comes back at 1.5 centimeters, right in between less than one centimeter and greater than two centimeters. So let's now look at collapsibility. If I were to ask you if this obviously collapses or barely collapses, it's somewhere in between. 
there is some collapsibility to it, but the walls aren't necessarily coming together all the way. So this is a patient who has an indeterminate IVC. This is a patient where you'd need to use other clinical correlation and data points to figure out if this patient's likely or unlikely to respond to fluid. Another word of caution is in patients who are intubated. Once you intubate a patient, you move their system from someone who draws air into their lungs through negative pressure to someone who has air drawn to their lungs by positive pressure. The problem with this is positive pressure can affect the IVC. By intubating a patient and providing positive pressure, the IVC starts to collapse. It can collapse by 50% with each ventilated breath. Thus, it's more difficult to determine if a patient's likely or unlikely to respond to fluid. So this is a scenario where you need to be very cautious when trying to interpret the IVC. Finally, the last word of caution is in patients who are taking deep breaths. The optimum way of measuring the IVC is by having the patient lie supine and have normal respiratory breathing. If they're taking very large breaths or very shallow breaths, it can affect the measurement of the IVC. Let's take a look at that. This is a patient who I'm trying to measure their IVC. You'll notice that the IVC walls almost completely touch, but when then the patient breathes out, the walls are quite far apart. This is a normal patient, and I'm asking them to take as deep a breath as possible. And you'll notice when they take a deep breath, their walls almost touch. If this patient were to breathe normally, this wouldn't be the case. So just be careful in patients who are taking very deep breaths, because it can affect the collapsibility of the IVC. In summary, each septic shock patient requires a different amount of fluid. IVC POCUS may help guide fluid and pressure management. If you've given a liter of fluid and the IVC is still flat and collapsing, they need more fluid. If you've given a liter of fluid and the patient's IVC is still full and barely collapsing, this is a patient who you might want to try early pressors in in order to improve their blood pressure. IVC POCUS should never be used as the only data point. There are indeterminants that need further clinical correlation. It's helpful to listen to the lungs, check the patient's extremity for pit and edema, and if you're the type of person who uses JVP as a marker, these can be clinical data points that can help determine if the patient's likely or unlikely to respond to fluid. Finally, be careful with the intubated patient and the patient who's taking deep breaths. IVC interpretations may not be accurate in these patients. As always, I'd love to hear from you. Please send an email to pocuscases at gmail.com if you have any questions.